our next topic that we're going to be talking about is the uh, bumps and triumphs on the road to implementing a DEI program. Um, you know, and this topic is one that Leslie, Alexa, and myself are, you know, really excited and passionate about. Um, and it's our hope that you can, you know, take something meaningful away from our presentation. You know, whether it's through the shared experiences that we've had, you know, our, our ups and downs, or even just getting started. I um, mean, you know, I think you'll find something in our presentation uh, that's for everybody and something that you can use. Um, you know, in public accounting, DEI is a very hot topic uh, right now. And so part of our presentation will be just trying to get you familiar uh, with the basics in terms of, you know, some of the definitions and introductions, as well as some of the reasons to take on such an initiative. Uh, you know, and so for me personally, it's really exciting to sort of step, step away from the technical side of things, get away from the Gatsby's for a little bit, and sort of focus on something that really impacts, you know, all of us on a daily basis. And so as far as the presenters for today's topic, um, you have Leslie Roberts, uh, who is a partner out of our Newport News office, uh, myself, Travis Gilmer, a director out of our Roanoke office. And then lastly, we have Alexa Keeler, who's our marketing specialist out of our Richmond office. And Alexa is actually the one that's sort of running everything today. So just really want to give a quick shout out to her. Um, and I just wanted to sort of point out that all three of us are on the firm's DEI task force. Uh, and this task force was established uh, in an effect since May of 2021. So we're coming up close to a year now. Um, and Leslie actually serves as the leader of the DEI task force. Um, we have just a little bit about this. We have monthly meetings. Uh, the first Tuesday of every month, we actually just had uh, one just a couple of days ago, um, and they're about an hour or so long. And the task force is composed of uh, 10 members across various offices and roles within the firm. So we have a good mix of people uh, on the task force. Um, so, you know, as you can imagine, starting a DEI program can be quite the undertaking. Uh, it has a lot of ups and downs and lessons that we've sort of learned through this process. And so we've sort of laid out our agenda uh, as as follows. Um, so we'll start off by defining DEI and the various parts of it to help sort of get a basic understanding and working knowledge of the topic. Um, then we'll talk about the case for DEI, uh, which will cover why DEI is important, and then sort of try to focus on various impacts of not only a CPA firm, uh, you know why it's important to us but how this topic is meaningful and impacts municipalities and then we'll talk about um, getting a dei initiative started uh, so this will sort of cover our process of trying to get this whole initiative started and sort of what all it took to get it going and off the ground and running um, then we'll talk about the the startup of a task force so some of the very first things we uh, you know did as a task force and sort of decided to try and accomplish uh, first um, then we'll talk a little bit about some of the current Brian Edwards Task Force initiatives, um, just highlighting some of the progress that we've made and items we'd like to accomplish this year and sort of just give you an idea of what, you know, someone else is doing uh, with this type of initiative. And then lastly, we'll be providing you with some nice sort of tools and resources so that you may uh, have them to come back to uh, whenever you may uh, need them in the future. So, you know, before we dive deep uh, into our topic, you know, I thought it'd be really beneficial to sort of cover the basics and really talking about and define uh, DEI, because um, it's a word that's really kind of thrown out there a lot. So diversity, equity, and inclusion, or it's commonly referred to as DEI, uh, is a term used to describe the policies and programs uh, that promote representation and participation of different groups of individuals, including people of different ages, races and ethnicities, abilities and disabilities, genders, religions, cultures, and sexual orientations. So it really is a wide range of people that it encompasses. And it also covers people with diverse backgrounds, experiences, skills, and even expertise. Um, and so in diversity involves all the ways that people are different, you know, race and ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, religion, age, etc. Equity uh, it aims to ensure fair treatment, access, quality of opportunity and advancement for everyone, while also attempting to identify and remove the barriers that prevented some groups from fully participating. And then lastly, uh, inclusion builds a culture where everybody feels welcomed, 
by actively inviting every person or every group to contribute uh, and participate. And so um, this image is sort of a nice sort of visualization of where diversity, equity, uh, and inclusion sort of overlap there in the middle to help form uh, belonging, uh, which is just when an organization that engages in the full potential of the individual where innovation thrives uh, and views and beliefs and values are integrated. And so, you know, probably one of the biggest questions that you might get, you know, or you might be thinking is ultimately, you know, why is DEI important? You know, why should we consider this? And why is it the topic that we're talking about today? Why is it something that, you know, we should consider? Um, and so uh, one of the things is just equal opportunities. Uh, DE matters because it helps build a fair society, allows all people to get equal opportunities. Uh, DEI brings together people, perspectives, and ideas to help create stronger bonds among individuals and create stronger organizations. Uh, there's also a morale case uh, for DEI. You know, everybody has something of value to contribute. And so it's really our responsibility to address some of these uh, barriers and factors that have helped cause some unfair conditions or underrepresented groups uh, in the past. Um, there's also an economic factor. You know, companies that seek out diverse candidates and or engage in diversity training are stronger, operate more efficiently. And so without diversity, organizations will lack new perspectives uh, and not really be as competitive as other companies who are embracing uh, diversity. And, and lastly, and probably honestly the most important, and I know it's one that we've probably all been dealing with the past couple of years, especially since COVID, um, is turnover and also culture. And so without a culture of equity and inclusion, employees who feel underrepresented uh, or unhappy are likely to quit and are gonna be taking their talents with them, uh, or you may not even get that talent to begin with. And so one of the challenges I sort of have to you, because it was really eye-opening to me, is you know sit down and talk with you know, a millennial in your organization, let's just say a 25-year-old, and talk to them about DEI and see how important it is to them, how meaningful it is, and how much they really want to see that in organizations that they're working with. Um, it was really eye-opening for me, and so I think that would be sort of a good process for you to sort of take on and see uh, for yourself how meaningful it is uh, to this younger generation. And so this uh, next image is sort of a popular one you may have seen before, and it sort of tries to provide a, a visual example of equality, equity, and sort of what removing barriers would sort of look like. So in the, the first image, it's assumed that everyone will benefit from the same supports. You know, they're sort of being treated equal. Um, in the second image, uh, individuals are given different supports to make it possible for them to have equal access in the game. Uh, so they're being treated equitably. Uh, and then lastly, in the, the third image, all three can see the game without any supports or accommodations because the cause of the inequity was addressed. So essentially the barrier had been removed. So this uh, next image is one that is actually from the AICPA uh, and it highlights 10 reasons to focus on diversity uh, and inclusion from research and studies performed by some of the biggest firms, you know, journals and magazines. And so I know it can kind of be a little bit small, but I thought it would be important to sort of touch on each of the 10 uh, and see how important uh, they are. Uh, there's, cause there's really some good statistics in here. So in terms of advanced performance at number one, uh, in a study, companies in the top quartile for ethnic and cultural diversity on executive teams were 33% more likely to have industry leading profitability. Number two, we have foster innovation and creativity. Companies with inherent or acquired diversity out-innovate others. Uh, employees in a speak-up culture are 3.5 times likely to contribute their full innovative potential. Number three, we have Evolve Productivity. And so a report that covered 366 public companies found that those which were more ethnically and gender diverse performed significantly better than others. Number four is Competitive Advantage. Uh, companies with a diverse leadership team 
are 45% more likely to report a growth in market share over the previous year. And companies with a diverse leadership teams are 70% more likely to capture a new market. Um, number five is grow intellectually. Uh, diverse groups are 58% more accurate in problem solving compared to homogeneous groups. Uh, collective and individual intelligence increases in diverse groups. Number six is demographic shifts. And I think this is a, really an important one is Generation Z is on track to be the nation's most diverse and best educated generation yet. And today nearly half, so approximately 48% are non-white. Um, a CNBC article states that the traditional nine to five office job doesn't adequately support the lives of millennials and Gen Zs want to live and they're sort of flexible work uh, natives now. Um, there's also an aspect that is social responsibility. Um, and this is kind of what I talked about earlier, you know, sitting down, talking to with a millennial, a Gen Z, and trying to get where they stand and how they feel about this topic. So an increasing number of millennials believe that the organizations have a moral obligation to give back to society in ways that create an inclusive environment for everyone uh, to participate and thrive. Um, there's also at number eight, uh, a market demand. So a study of more than 1,300 full-time employees found that an inclusive culture is key to both hiring and retaining talent. 80% um, of respondents said that inclusion is an important factor in choosing an employer. Uh, nearly a quarter of all respondents left jobs due to lack of diversity or inclusion. And so an inclusion strategy is really key to retaining a diverse workforce and key to retaining people. Um, there's also talent acquisition. So while 74% of executives view DEI as crucial to the success of their organization, most companies do not take advantage of DEI to attract top talent. And so by failing to embed you know, DEI into talent strategies or recruiting, you know, companies not only miss out on exceptional talent, but also the benefits realized by diverse talent and inclusive culture. And then lastly, we have you know, cultivating engagement. And so 40% of people say that they feel isolated at work and the results have been lower commitment and engagement. And so belonging is linked to a 55% increase in job performance and a 50% drop in turnover risk and a 75% reduction in sick days used. And so the next sort of couple of slides, just going to talk about, you know, personally, the, the case for DEI and CPA firms, and then we'll go into municipalities. And so I think that the case for DEI and, and CPA firms is really a strong one. Um, as a profession, we've sort of hit an inflection point where we have to embrace and implement changes in order to remain competitive uh, in our marketplace. You know, and although I'm going to sort of highlight some of the items that are specific to CPA firms, you know, I want you to sort of think about these in the context of a locality you work at and think you'll find there's a tremendous amount uh, of overlap and information that is relevant to you. And so you have the, uh, the changing landscape in the workplace and client base. So it's really about being proactive versus reactive to these changes. And so it's one of those things that's really important. And if you don't start an initiative, you sort of kind of get behind the ball and you're sort of trying to constantly then play catch up. Um, so it's, you know, sort of based on that, it's really not sort of optional, but almost obligatory in order to stay relevant amongst other large firms right now. Uh, Generation Z is on track to be the nation's most diverse and best educated generation yet. And today, you know, nearly half, 48% are, are non-white. And then implementing DEI programs and policies can demonstrate to current employees that company cares about them and wants to create an environment that makes all employees feel they belong. And that sort of kind of just goes back to really the culture of the company and just how important that can be and how important a DEI strategy can be in helping improve uh, your culture. And then there's also a diverse practice. So the more diverse you know, our practice is, you know, they're more richer, our work life and client base is, you know, and honestly, our client base is changing. And so we really have to be able to adapt and change ourselves. And so diverse clients and colleagues in your sphere 
enables you to be more creative and also more innovative. And then there's also um, work, work uh, culture. So millennials desire an inclusive work environment where everyone can participate and really thrive. And so the culture at work uh, can be a huge part of an employee's happiness. And having the right culture can be key to longer retention uh, and less turnover. And I know cultivating a, you know, an inclusive and a good uh, work culture can be difficult, um, but it's really, really important uh, this day and age, especially you know the past two years, everything that we've experienced, um, it's really important to have a good culture and, and DEI can be a part of that. And then lastly, and you know, something that we've sort of all felt is turnover and retention. So an inclusive culture can be key to both hiring and retaining talent and also choosing an employer. So when employees are happy and feel included at work, they generally feel more fulfilled in their professional work life and are happier. Um, DEI can help retain and attract new employees who you know, may be absent of DEI initiatives might not have been interested in the firm uh, at all. And so now we'll talk a little bit about the case uh, for municipalities on the next few slides. So, you know, communities across the country are changing rapidly in terms of, you know, the population diversities. A sense of data uh, projections indicate that by 2050, there will be no pronounced racial or ethnic majority uh, in the nation. Um, and in the 2020 census, uh, the multiracial population has changed considerably since the last census in 2010. Uh, the population was 9 million in 2010 and increased 276% in 2020 to 33.8 million. So really kind of depending on your location, your surrounding, and obviously many other economic and social factors, some localities are experiencing a higher percentage of diversity uh, in its uh, population. So in order for localities to continue to grow economically and educationally, it'll be important for them to continue to grow in its ability to integrate its population diversity. So being an inclusive locality is an important element in having it grow um, with the times and sort of be considered a good place to live. And so, and I think this is really key, so I really want to, to sort of stress this, is that the pursuit of diversity should not be a politically correct strategy or a public relations gimmick, um, but rather a strategy to maintain profitability and really sustainability going into the future. So, you know, any business or organization can benefit from incorporating uh, DEI concepts. Um, municipalities are sort of unique so, because they're at the level of government closest to people. So decisions are made at all levels that have profound impacts on you know, policy, service delivery, uh, civic engagement, and even community life. Municipalities are responsible for the quality of life of the residents. So addressing social inequities to ensure inclusion of all residents is really a cost effective at a time that you know, there's really shrinking annual budget, budget each year. Um, equity and inclusion create more sustainable local governments where people from all walks of life have the right to and can fully participate in you know, social, economic, political, and even cultural life. Um, municipalities are leaders in this work and they're engaging in many promising practices that are making it a, a difference uh, as they continue to diversify their staff and and management so as to be more representative of the communities they serve, uh, their understanding of the perspectives of specific communities really deepens. And so an inclusive culture can result in increased productivity, you know, higher retention rates, uh, and enhanced community relations. And so for many local governments, the pathway uh, towards advancing equity really begins with training and facilitated conversations for staff and elected officials. Uh, this training is helpful and beneficial of a common vocabulary, understanding the equity concepts across our organization. And that's really where Brown Edwards started with this task force. And I think the most significant and meaningful thing um, that we sort of achieved in the past year is we had a firm-wide um, 
training on unconscious bias. And we try to keep it relatively short. I think it was about an hour and a half or so. Um, but we wanted to make sure everybody in the firm was sort of exposed to that. And so I think really training and putting stuff out there is really a good step um, to get this initiative started. And so municipalities sort of face challenges in taking on or continuing uh, equity work. Obviously, there are limited financial resources that you have. Um, and especially right now with you know, turnover or hiring, you know, there's competing demands on staff time. Um, I know that we certainly feel that as well. Uh, there's uncertainty over really the best approach to do this kind of work. You know, you don't want to do it the wrong way. You want to make sure that you do it right. Um, there's disbelief that inequities exist. And certainly in the survey that we took in our firm, you know, there's going to be that in a large organization. Um, there's going to be that thought that is out there. Um, there may be potentially lack of political will, um, or there may just be limited knowledge of the value of using an intersectional lens. So, you know, a lens that takes into account the ways in which advantage and disadvantage sort of intersect uh, to affect how people experience policies and also uh, programs. And so there's many reasons why a local government uh, would consider undertaking uh, a DEI. So there's improved decision making that better represents all communities and is less likely to sort of suffer from unintentional blind spots or, or biases. There's increased community trust in local government by offering more options for community members to be seen and heard, as well as other better understanding of local government uh, initiatives. Uh, there's a more equitable allocation of public resources to all communities. There's also an increased trust between community members by offering citizens more opportunities to interact with one another. And then lastly, there's uh, improved employee satisfaction you know, helping reduce staff turnover and increasing employee engagement and awareness. And so, you know, as you sort of begin to think about what lies ahead, you know, I just wanted to kind of throw out there a couple of reminders and that change is fluid and constant. And obviously, you know, when we started this process, we didn't know all the answers, but we knew that we needed to get started we needed to try things and to see what worked, what didn't work, and just kind of learning as we go. So, but the important, I think, thing with anything is really just kind of getting started and get the train sort of moving. And so, you know, just keep in mind that change can be achieved from multiple entry points. If you try something and it doesn't work, that's okay. You know, try something else, figure out what works best um, with your organization. And so, you know, keep in mind that, you know, tensions are not always negative. Um, it's sort of the push and pull between forces that helps create um, positive change. Um, it also helps to sort of ask the question, you know, who is not included and what can we do to increase inclusion um, really is a, a good practice. Um, there's identities and issues that are complex and dynamic, so make sure you listen to and work with um, communities. And every, you know, just kind of keep in mind that every municipality has its own unique story, its own de demographics. So it's, everybody's unique. There's not a one size that really sort of fits all when it comes to this type of initiative. And then you know, just keep in mind that citizen and community organizations, even not-for-profits are really eager, eager to help find solutions and help out um, with this type of, of process. And so this next graphic is just one that sort of shows the government's role ensuring uh, equitable access to different types of goods and services. So you have um, public uh, goods there on the left. Uh, so those are things such as roads and highways and bridges, public transit, public schools and parks and libraries. And this sort of helps ensure inclusive equitable access. And then you also have quasi public goods such as you know, healthcare, higher education and internet and uh, access and, and Wi-Fi. And so they help ensure inclusive, equitable access and affordability. And then lastly, we have private goods, um, which such are, you know, private lending and credit, affordable housing, private sector employment and hiring. And these really sort of help promote fairness and equity.
through sort of nudging incentives provided. So with that being said, we'll go into our uh, first polling question, which is, has your municipality considered a DEI task force? Yes, no, or unsure? Launching the poll. And Travis, we did have a question come in that I will read out to you after I close the poll. Sounds good. Closing the poll. Okay, so we had 43% yes, 21% no, and 36% unsure. Well, I'd say there's at least a pretty good mix there. You know, obviously excited about the, the yes, uh, understandable with the no because there's a lot going on, and obviously unsure because there's a lot going on, especially this year when you have you know, leases being implemented, you have ARPA funding, there's just so much that, you know, just on the day-to-day -day you have to do that can be difficult to sort of add something else to your to your plate. Um, so I'm going to sort of pass it off to Leslie now, um, who's gonna talk about, you know, sort of the startup and, and more things that are specific to Brown Edwards. Thank you, Travis. Um, I'm gonna read the question off really quick. One thing I've noticed in speaking with members of marginalized groups from older generations is that they feel more jaded about the impactful application of DEI. What can managers do to combat that feeling in their workplace? Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, we did a, a survey that asked a lot of different questions. We wanted to sort of gauge where um, we as a firm stood and what were the views. And obviously we received some of that. Every organization is going to. And I still, I think the key is to not approach it from a, a point of like, um, you know, this is something we have to do, like you really need to try and sell them on the benefits of it and why it's important. And so for us, and I can use just as a CPA for an example, is that, you know, turnover and retention and stuff like that is difficult right now for us. It's difficult for everybody. Every public accounting firm, every just company in general is in with that. And so having an inclusive uh, culture and environment is really important to getting new people in. And, and keeping them long term, um, and so it's also talking about you know helping them explain the statistics. So maybe you could talk about how your um, customers are changing, your client base, and how if you want to still be relevant, how you have to incorporate them into your your strategies and stuff like that. And so one of the case studies I actually read up on a little bit that I didn't really mention was uh, in Morgantown, West Virginia. Obviously, you have WVU there. And so they, what they looked at, and they actually had some nonprofits help them with this study, is that they are the most like diverse area in West Virginia. And so they actually used some of the nonprofits to help them sort of do a case study and figure out, you know, how their demographics and stuff like that were changing and how they needed to sort of change and maybe think about new strategies or new programs to help gear towards their changing um, people that are in their locality. So I think it's, sort of synopsis is just kind of helping them see the benefits of it and not focusing on you know why we have to do it you know talk about the pros of it and why it's really meaningful and i think if you talk about turnover and retention that's probably going to get you know, catch anybody's ear uh, just to start with so i hope that answers it a little bit i know uh, leslie and i could probably talk about this a lot but uh, that should do it for at least for the moment Okay, well, I guess you've turned it over to me at this point. Um, my name is Leslie Roberts, and I'm a partner in our new news office. I'm also a partner in our governmental practice industry niche. And um, so some of you guys might know me personally. Um, I was asked to head, head up the DEI task force back in June of 2020. And the main reason I was asked is I had a passion for the subject, and I had been telling everybody that wanted to listen or would listen why and what, why it was really important. Um, I was also involved in the Women's Ford Initiative at a previous firm, 
And that went really well. And I thought that was a very important initiative. But I guess the biggest reason and the biggest, the biggest drive behind my passion is that I've worked with HBCUs, Historic Black Colleges and Universities, for the majority of my career. And I really have a passion for helping those students, uh, many of whom are first generation students, achieve goals in, in, in effective careers. I've seen the barriers that they have and um, really feel for that. And so I think that is probably my biggest reason for being passionate about this. But of course, everything that Travis pointed out, there's all kinds of good reasons to get behind a DEI strategy and DEI initiative. Um, when the racial turmoil happened back in 2020, first part, middle of 2020, our firm management was really willing and anxious to set me loose on this initiative. So basically in June, they told me, you know, go ahead, start this DEI initiative. And um, this is when I learned that passion does not equate to knowledge. Because while I was really excited about getting started and while I was really bought into the reasons behind it and the need for it, I really didn't know what to do. Uh, you know, I just, you know, I, I just immersed myself in learning material. I did webinars, podcasts, everything I could get a hold of just to kind of learn more about the subject and see what was being done in that area. Um, I actually probably did that all the way through governmental busy season, um, all the way till November. Um, during that time, I also joined a DEI roundtable discussion group that was put on by BDO, which is one of the larger CPA firms and one that we're affiliated with. And they held monthly meetings and uh, the participants were people like me, not always partners, but people in accounting firms that were championing a DEI effort. And it was really a good place for me to be when I was trying to figure out how to start out because there were people like me that really had no idea where to start, what to do, who, you know, what resources to use. And there were other people that had been doing this for a few years um, and really have, were further down the road and had had lots of bumps and triumphs, like we said, uh, along the way. So their wisdom was really key. Um, but really, after all of that, I still wasn't sure how to start. It was just pretty overwhelming. And there seemed to be so much that needed to be done. And that's when I stumbled on some resources at the AICPA. And um, again, overwhelming. They had all kinds of stuff on, on DEI and you know, different things you could do and so forth. And, and um, But I did notice that they had a head of the program, Crystal Cook, and she had some information about, you know, if you want to reach out and get more information, just reach out to me and I'll be happy to meet with you. So I took advantage of that. And we um, had a virtual meeting, which everything was being done virtually then, as it most mostly is now, but um, we had a virtual meeting and, I explained my passion and kind of my inability to know where to start. And um, she said, well, you really should take this assessment that we offer, it's a maturity analysis. And I said, oh. at, at first I was just like, well, I wanna do that. I mean, we haven't done anything. So, I mean, obviously that's just gonna be discouraging because, you know, we haven't started any initiative. And she said, oh, you'd be surprised. You're probably doing some things that you don't realize. Um, and if nothing else, even if you score really low in every category, it'll point out where you're doing the worst and where you might start. And so I agreed to do that. And I got together with, with our director of HR and our COO, and they assisted me in filling out, which it's basically a questionnaire and um, turning it in. But before I turned it in, I actually showed it to a couple employees here at the news office and said for a gut check and said, does this resonate with you? And um, so we turned it in, we got the results. Um, as expected, we, we scored pretty low, but it, there were a couple of categories that we scored higher than I thought we would. It was basically, it's broken down into four categories, workplace, workforce, supplier and community, and marketplace. And we scored lowest in workplace and workforce. 
in the supplier and community and the marketplace, we were doing some things that I didn't realize and doing better. Um, so I went back to Crystal and said, okay, what do I do with these results? And Crystal went through and basically gave me some action items that we could, we could uh, consider were some of the areas where we had scored lowest. And you know, a lot of them were low hanging fruit, things I thought we could do pretty quickly and get them in place and, and really have some impact. Um, so it, this essentially became mine and the eventual task force playbook for our initiative. Every time we, we, we get something and we feel like we've got it down and we're moving forward, I go back to this and, and see, okay, what are some other action items that we should, could be taking? Um, the second slide is just kind of, I want, getting buy-in is really the first step. I mean, I, I was encouraged to see that so many of you have already started this because I know that just forming a task force and making sure that we really have buy-in from top management was essential. And I know, at least for Brown Edwards, that top management was fearful of making mistakes right off the start and losing, you know, losing integrity and, you know, not really having this effort um, adhered to or respected. And so they were very hesitant to set me loose. Once, once I decided I'm going for it, I need this task force. Um, so at first, we, they agreed we needed a task force. They agreed that me and the COO and the head of HR couldn't do everything. Um, so we went in and we kind of cherry picked people around the firm. And I, when I say cherry picked, I mean, we really tried to be fair. We wanted to have people at all levels and we wanted to have every people across our whole firm demographic. And we wanted as much um, diversity in race and gender and everything else as we could get. And so we did that. And then we met with a consultant, a D, uh, a DEI consultant, and the consultant basically told us, whoa, you're already starting out wrong, which was again, what management was afraid we might do, um, because we really can't just pick people. We need to give everybody at least the opportunity to say they wanna be involved. And so what we ended up doing at that point was um, writing up a firm-wide email that would go out. And I can't tell you how many writes and rewrites and reviews we had a bad email before it went out but basically it talked about the need for DEI and management's agreement that we needed to start a DEI effort um, just some basic uh, discussion about what it's about and it was an ask for task force members and thank goodness we got a lot of response actually we got more response than we needed or wanted because we really wanted to keep the group down to like Travis said, we have 10 people on our DEI task force. We wanted to keep it um, small enough so we'd be able to react um, and make decisions and not have a lot of a lot of controversy, at least within the group. And um, so the small task force was was started, and um, those 10 individuals were chosen. Travis and, Ale and Alexa, who you'll hear from later, are part of that 10 member group. And I can say beyond a shadow of a doubt, every member of that group is very committed to this effort and um, spend a lot of time and are willing to spend a lot of their time on the effort. And it's important to them personally. Um, like I said earlier, we're, we're using that AI CPA assessment tool as our playbook. And so just to give you an idea, some of the early initiatives that we started um, were slow. We, they required a lot of oversight from management and again, very fearful that we'd make the wrong move and lose cred credibility. Uh, we had our first meeting, like Travis said, back in May of 2021. And the things that we decided to do off the bat were write our mission statement. And that really took a long time. And that went through a lot of review and edits. And, and basically that was our, you know, our reason why we, what we're trying to accomplish with DEI. And we have that on our internal and our external website. But again, it took a long time to go through all the approval processes and so forth. Um, and another thing we wanted to start, which we thought we could start right away and it would be easy, 
is a cultural calendar. And basically that's taking some cultural events each month and providing like an article knowledge share on it to kind of explain what are they celebrating and why, what's the history behind it and so forth. And um, that's that's been very eye-opening. We're still doing that and we'll continue to do that. But at first, we had a little kickback from that because the first couple of months we, we highlighted different events and celebrations. I had a few other people and at all levels call me and say, well, why didn't you choose this over this? And um, because that's important to me. And I, I was lucky because we had decided to use a cultural calendar put on, put forth by the AICPA. And I was able to say, well, this is what we're starting with. We're not trying to exclude anybody or, or anything like that. We just have to have a starting place. And we'll build on that over the year. And we're coming up on our first year of doing this for a year. So we're looking for another calendar and definitely don't want to celebrate the same things or educate on the same events. But um, it, it was hard to get that started, even though you would think, just put out articles, nobody cares, but they do care because they're, this is important to our staff and it's probably important to your staff too, um, how we enter this space. Another thing, another early initiative is just getting um, stuff out on our website internally and externally and just getting all of that put together, approved and in a format that was, was appropriate. And I, I think we took probably getting all those things together probably took our first three or four months, believe it or not. And then after that, it seems like everybody's kind of backed off and said, okay, you guys got this task force. You can, you can start doing your own thing. And we've had very little oversight since then. Um, and we've really um, been able to kind of move forward our initiatives with without that much impact from leadership at this point. But I think we've got a polling question coming up. So let's do that and then we can go on. I'll tell you about some things that we are doing right now. Okay, this polling question is how important, how important is starting a DEI initiative to you personally? Very important, important, somewhat important or not important at all? Launching the poll. Closing the poll now. Okay, that's pretty encouraging. Seems like it's somewhat important. Very few people say it's not important. I think, you know, part of, you know, webinars like what we're doing now is to kind of, kind of get some um, enthusiasm around this effort. And like Travis pointed out, show why it should be important to you and your organization. So I think we're really getting there and I'm very encouraged by your responses. Um, like I said, just a few things that we're currently working on. Um, like Tra Travis said, trading is so important. You don't know what you don't know. And um, like you said, we had that firm wide unconscious bias training back in November. And we, all, we also made that part of our, we take that, that training and it's part of our onboarding package for our new hires. So again, trying to get this into our culture. So it's something that we're all conscious about and we're all working towards. Um, right now, we're looking at other training options. Of course, we do want to continue to have a firm-wide uh, training on an annual basis on some type of DEI topic. Right now, we kind of look at different topics. Um, generational differences is one of them, or just expanding upon unconscious bias. Now that you know your bias, how do you act? you know, going to the next step. So we're looking at just if something like that to build upon, but you know, our commitment is that we'll do some type of DEI training firm-wide annually. And probably being in the November timeframe, which is really hard for us governmental folks, but um, works out for the rest of the firm really well. So 
when we can get the most participation is when we want to do those firm-wide trainings. Um, the other things that I'm really excited about are inclusive leadership trainings. We're all, we are trying to roll out or in process of rolling out two types of trainings, one for our manager, senior manager, and director groups. And this one is particularly exciting because we're doing a train the trainer model where we're taking seven um, employees of Brown Edwards and sending them out for training on inclusive leadership and then getting materials. We're using an outside consultant to train them, provide the materials, and then they're going to come back and facilitate the sessions with the consultant in the background if there's anything that they can't answer or something comes up that you know they can't handle. But um, we're planning on rolling that out this um, June to our whole manager, senior manager, and director group. And we're going to do four to five sessions. So we're really excited about that because of the train the trainer model and the training. Because again, trying to impact culture. And we feel like having the trainers in-house really does more to impact culture. We're also doing a inclusive leadership training for our partners and directors, uh, no partners, this fall. And it will be the same kind of format. It will be an in-person format. This will be done by an outside um, consultant. And this will probably be a two to four hour training. So again, trying to impact culture at all levels. And then the other training we're rolling out this year is um, training for our recruiting professionals. And I don't mean just our campus recruiters and so forth. I mean everybody in the firm that that participates in any level of the recruiting, whether it's going to job fairs or actually doing interviews and screening. Uh, we've identified about 35 people across the firm's uh, footprint. They're involved in recruiting and they will be going to training in the late summer, early fall, just in time for fall recruiting. And their training will be um, around removing bias from this process. And uh, I think that's really important to recruiting diverse candidates. And um, and we're, we're looking at, and just to throw this in, we're, re we're recruiting at places we didn't use to recruit at to, to find those diverse candidates, which is exciting too. Um, Looks like I'm talking too much, so I'm going to let you read about the other things we're doing. We're doing newsletters. We're trying to get CPAs in the classroom to, to try to promote and get high school students interested in our profession to try to get a pipeline. Uh, we're participating in a scholarship that was that the AICPA awards. Uh, we were selected um, among only 10 firms nationally, so we're really excited about that. And we're able to get out a $10,000 scholarship in addition to they're going to give us a pool of applicants that are diverse so to, for our internship program. So hopefully we can give out a $10,000 scholarship and hire a lot of diverse applicants. Um, also, we're working on task force video and we're just really busy and really excited about everything that's been going on. Um, and you know, hope, hopefully this is giving you kind of initiative if you're on the fence about why this is important, giving you some initiative because you really can do it. And this small group is being very impactful across our firm. And now we're gonna go to a polling question and Alexa's gonna share some, um, some resources with you. Launching the last poll for this presentation. Closing the poll. Okay, that response is right in line with what I thought. Okay, um, I'm gonna turn the um, presentation back over to Alexa to share with you guys some resources and tools 
um, some that we've used and some that Alexa has just found that are specific to governmental entities. Thank you, Leslie, and uh, thank you, Travis, for that great introduction earlier on. Um, I did want to start off by saying that all of these um, presentations will be sent out after, um, after we're done today. So all of these links that I'll be sharing, you should be able to go in um, and click and view the PDFs and the websites. So first up, I wanted to touch back on a slide that um, Travis presented on earlier. It was the 10 reasons to focus on diversity and inclusion. Um, and this is a great tool to use for getting that leadership buy-in. Um, and that link will kind of take you to that web page with all of the all of the clickable things um, and those also those firm success stories that were shared. Next up um, is after you gain that leadership buy-in, you might want to consider presenting um, this to your CEO. So there is a pledge uh, for diversity and inclusion that CEOs from very major um, leading companies across the US have signed. Um, and this is a way to kind of show that outward commitment to driving change and supporting this initiative. Next slide, Travis. The last resource from the AICPA that I wanted to share is an employee survey. Um, and this is a great tool for you to use to kind of use as that starting point when sending out that internal employee assessment to kind of see where the firm thinks you are and where you could improve. So that way you don't have to worry about creating those questions from scratch or worrying about um, what questions to include and what not to include. Next resource that I wanted to share is a webinar from the GFOA. And while this is a little bit older of a webinar, um, it is a really great resource for you um, to watch and learn about how finance officers um, can embrace and apply such practices in today's world. Um, and also a way for you to look at some other industry experts in the field. Another group that I wanted to share with you is the International City County Management Association. Um, and the ICMA is an association of professional city and county managers and other employees who serve on local governments. And they offer membership, professional development programs, research, publications, data and information, technical assistance, and training to thousands of city town um, administrative officers and other staff throughout the world. And on their website, they have an equity and social justice tools and resource page. And on this page, you'll be able to find some leading practices in use in communities around the world, an equity and inclusion toolkit, and links to many other great resources. Next up is Gov HR USA. And this is a certified women-owned business that provides comprehensive recruitment, staffing, and consulting um, to local governments, intergovernmental organizations, school districts, as well as other governmental and nonprofit entities. And they have a dedicated page um, with diversity, equity, and inclusion resources that will help assist you and your organization with your um, DEI goals. And on this webpage, you will find implicit bias resources, a guide to organizational analysis, DEI resource organizations, advertising resources, and also a bunch of other additional information. And last but not least is the Government Alliance on Race and Equity. And the Government Alliance on Race and Equity is a national network of governments working to achieve racial equity and advancement opportunities for all. And on their website, they have a really great tools and resources page um, that includes materials from their events, including national and regional assemblies and webinars, issue papers that describe topics and approaches that have impact, as well as examples from cities and counties that provide the opportunity for you to learn um, from the experiences and pitfalls of others. And on this page, you will also find a racial equity tool from the Alliance that captures an overall approach to integrating racial equity into routine decision making, as well as some examples from their cohort of jurisdictions at the forefront of racial equity. Um, and as I said, all of these are clickable links that you can go and visit at your own time. Um, and now I'm going to open up the floor for questions. 
I haven't seen any come through, um, but if you have any, please feel free to let us know. And I hope you enjoyed our presentation today.